thank you all so much for coming out tonight. We'd like to take time before we get started and go over a few things. We've got a couple uh, PowerPoints that we would like to show everybody to bring everybody up with what Wacomico County is doing now, where we get our revenues, how we spend our money. So with that, but I would like to thank those from Wacomico County employees for being here tonight. Thank you so much, all the staff that helped work so hard on this PowerPoint, as well as all the figures that we've done and backing this up tonight. So. Everybody will have a time to speak, and we, we want to hear you, but I do ask that if anybody has had someone come before them and said basically what you were planning on saying, let it ride us that. We don't need everybody to speak three or four minutes. We do want to hear every opinion and every point that somebody has, but at the same time, we need, we need to be able to move on. So um, if you would, I want to welcome Wayne Strasburg. He's going to start off with the slides now. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Before I get started, uh, I'd just like to recognize some folks who are in the room. We have uh, from the County Council, we have Councilman uh, Bill McCain. Uh, we have Councilman Mark Kilmer. Uh, City Council, we have uh, City Council President Jack Heath. We have Dr. Ray Hoy from Warwick. We have our Superintendent of Schools, Donna Hanlon. We have several uh, Board of Education uh, members, if they could just stand up so that everybody recognizes you're here. We also have Jamie Dykes, our state's attorney. I see that President John Cannon from the County Council just walked in. And uh, we have Randy Day present, the uh, president of Purdue. Pleasure to have you here tonight. If I've missed anyone, you can throw stones at me later. I just can't see everybody that clearly. So before we get started, um, I want to start off by giving you um, a macro view of what we believe we're going to be looking at in the next 12 to, to 18 months. And if, if, if I was a weatherman, I would tell you that it's cloudy with a chance of rain. And um, just to give you some, some ideas about what I believe, what we believe we're going to be facing, uh, the state has already written down their budget uh, by $400 million, basically as a result of jobs data that, that they're looking at. So the state's looking at a write, a write down. Here in Wacomico County, our jobs peak was in July of 2017. We had 53,127 jobs then. Uh, at July of 2018, we have 51,412. We have seasonal employment here, so the summer months are always our highest months of employment. So right now in January, we've got 51,412 jobs. Um, I mean 47,206 jobs, I'm sorry. If, if, if you adjust for seasonality and you take a look at what we believe the run rate is, we think that, that we've uh, lost probably about 1,700 jobs from the peak. Uh, we don't have accurate data on where those jobs may have been lost, but we know that uh, our run rate, if you will, is that much below what our run rate <coughs> was back in 2017. Why that's important is because the state of Maryland distributes local income tax receipts anywhere from 14 to 16 months in arrears. So when we're looking at the income tax receipts that we're receiving right now, that's from employment 14 to 16 months ago. So you've got to trend that out for where your employment has gone to see where you believe your receipts are going to be in about 12 to 14 months. There is good news, however. Uh, our latest triennial property assessments rose 11%, um, primarily driven by a 30.9% increase in commercial assessments, about 5.4% increase in, um, in residential. So for that reason, our projected real property revenue for this coming fiscal year is going to increase by uh, 1,574,484. Uh, that's the allowable amount of revenue increase that we're permitted under the revenue cap. State spending uh, to the county will increase, or sp state funding 
to the county will increase slightly. Our highway user revenue is going to go up by about $120,000. Our disparity grant is going to go up by about $679,000. The disparity grant, for those of you who are interested in these kinds of things, <coughs> like me, um, be, because the state mandates certain spending at state averages, the state also recognizes that we have 24 different jurisdictions that have 24 different economies, 24 different wealth indexes. So. They, they try to level out the playing field, if you will, by sending disparity grants to counties uh, that, that have smaller economies and lower wealth indexes. So in total, our anticipated revenue uh, for major categories this year will increase just under $2.1 million. But the state giveth and the state taketh away. Um, minimum wage legislation, which is going to pass and which is virtually veto-proof, is going to raise the minimum wage to $15 over either five years or six years. That's the, I believe that's the battleground right now. So at 40 hours a week, if you convert that to full-time employment, uh, that's $31,200 a year. Uh, Wicomico County's median individual income is right around $35,000. So there, there is an anticipation that that will cause some level of job fallout. Uh, those are pretty expensive minimum wage uh, uh, rates. The, the direct impact on Wacomic County over the five years because of the, the, the need to slide your wage scale to avoid what's called wage uh, scale compression is about $7 million. So over the next five years, the minimum wage alone is probably going to impact the county uh, to the tune of $7 million. That's recurring. That's every year. So that'll be $7 million additional general fund spending um, once this graduation takes place. You've probably all heard about the Kerwin Commission. And the Kerwin Commission uh, anticipated spending from 2020 to 2030 is $3.8 billion. And the state has not identified any revenue source yet. For those of you who were around when Thornton was passed, uh, this is, as Yogi Berra would say, this is deja vu all over again because Thornton passed with some pretty stiff spending mandates and no uh, credible funding source. So it, it's a concern to those of us in the 24 jurisdictions and municipalities as to how that will be affordable, how much of that the counties and the municipalities will have to bear. So the prospect of a slowing economy coupled with pricey state mandates has made forecasting this year much more difficult than it, it has been in past years. So our, our consensus as we built our budget, and it's nearly complete, was that we needed to be a bit cautioned, cautious until that picture clears. So let's go through the math that we went through, if you will. This, this is really what I've already gone through with you, other than the fact that um, most economists in the state are predicting a recession starting in mid-2020. Uh, the head of the Office of Budget Management, State Office of Budget Management, actually uh, attached a date to it. Uh, I think he said uh, June 21st of 2020. I don't know how he got to that, but he's smarter than me. So let's look at how our fiscal 18 actual general fund revenue came in. You can see that the vast majority of general fund revenue comes from two sources, our local property taxes and our local income taxes, uh, 37 and 47 percent between the two of those. Our breakdown in uh, fiscal 18 actual general fund expenses, uh, let me just give you uh, the highlights. Um, Board of Education was $50.4 million. Uh, public Safety was $36 million. Public Works was right around $11 million. Our debt service uh, was around $15.5 million. When you take those and add all of those, it comes up to about $112 million. 
which is, is, is core spending. So when, when you cover those areas, uh, it, gets, it gets quite skinny when you begin to address the other spending uh, that's needed in the county and desired in the county. So this just graphs where we've been uh, from a tax revenue standpoint. You can see that we had uh, have had a nice rise in our property taxes that started in fiscal 16. It's continuing through this year. You'll also see, as I alluded to earlier, the line below that are local income taxes, and you can see that we peaked in fiscal 17 and uh, tapered off a little bit in fiscal 18. Uh, we anticipate this year, based on the, the distributions that we've been getting so far from the state, we believe that we'll be in the neighborhood of $52 million in local income tax receipts this year. So let's talk about uh, our potential revenue. As I told you earlier, uh, we have embedded in our budget uh, for fiscal 20 uh, the allowable mill rate under the revenue cap. Uh, that's 93.46 uh, cents. Our current rate is 93.98 cents. The yield on the 93.46 cents is 58 million 242. 478. Just to give you your bearings, one penny on the tax rate yields uh, around $623,000. Personal property, we're looking at about $8.5 million. Each penny on that mill rate is about $39,000. We have the ability to raise the personal property tax rate up to about $2.34. We think that's counterproductive. Uh, given, uh, particularly given the business environment that we feel we may be having to deal with. So we're leaving that rate alone uh, for the time being. Budget summary. These are major cost centers. So on, on, the, on the downside, if you will, we asked our departments, what we did is we asked our departments, we went back and looked at five years of actual spending. So we didn't build this budget on the basis of, well, let's take a look at last year's budget and let's build a budget based on last year's budget. We went back five years, looked at five years of actual spending by department, and we started, we started there. Okay? Essentially, we started with the uh, actual spending of 2018 because we felt that that was the most recent spending, our best, our best starting point. So several of our departments were able to manage their budget requests down. Um, corrections, the sheriff's departments, our roads department, our state's attorney, and um, actually our volunteer fire. I don't know how that happened. I'll have to go back and look at that one. On, on the plus side, we're moving. Uh, the Board of Education is going to increase. Community college is going to increase. Debt retirement is going to increase in and of itself just because of our borrowing and uh, public health is going to increase, emergency service is going to increase. So when you look at where the increased spending is, it's by and large, by and large in, in education and um, health education and uh, public safety. We put this slide in here because I think, I think it bears uh, discussion. Um, we, we hear a lot about the fact that Wicomico County's county contribution to the Board of Education is the second lowest in the state. When you look at our ranking by per pupil wealth, we're also the second lowest in the state. So the correlation between the ability of the county to appropriate is directly tied to our wealth as a county. We're 23rd out of 24 jurisdictions in the state in terms of per capita wealth. However, total funding per pupil is 13th, and that's because, go back to what I said about the state helping poorer counties, the state does contribute a significant amount to Wacomico County's Board of Education and other poor counties' Board of Education to level that playing field again. So we're right in the middle of the pack, if you will, in terms of per pupil funding. And I think it's important for everyone to have that context. 
This is graphing of our local appropriation per pupil. You can see how that aligns, and you can see that the full-time equivalent enrollment is, is somewhat, um, is somewhat um, corollary to the local appropriation per pupil. This is just graphing the county's annual contribution to the Board of Education. Uh, this includes our maintenance of effort, our pension contribution, and the debt principal and interest payments associated with the, the debt that we take out to build uh, our, our schools and to embark on systemic renovations. So you can say that there's been a fairly, there's been a fairly steady climb. If you go back to fiscal 13, uh, that's really when we were hitting the depths of the recession. For fiscal 20, uh, we are fully funding, or we're proposing from the executive administration to fully fund uh, Dr. Hanlon and the Board of Education's request uh, for $800,000 above maintenance of effort so that she can continue on with her uh, Imagine 22. I know you're not interested in any of this. That was the slide that you were really here for. I understand that. Um, from employee compensation, uh, we're proposing a 2% COLA for county employees. The fraternal order of police are in their last year of negotiated step increases, so obviously we're going to fund that. Major capital projects. You've heard a lot about the airport. There are significant infrastructure projects at the airport that we plan to fund new public safety building uh, for the sheriff and EMS, and continuing on uh, with the construction of Beaver Run Elementary, uh, the replacement of that school. We feel that that's critically important. And we will turn it over to you now for any questions you may have, anything that we may have glossed over that you'd like to talk about in more detail, and any comments that you would like to make. Good evening. My name is Mike Dunn. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Salisbury Committee. And on behalf of the Greater Salisbury Committee and the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce president, Bill Chambers couldn't be here tonight because he's meeting um, with the governor. This is significant. Thank you. Um, specifically, putting in full funding for Imagine 2022 is unimaginable. This is, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Straussberg. Thank you, Weston. Thank you, Mr. Culver. This is saying to the community that investment in education matters. And thank you very much. And we will be in full support of this. And we will be encouraging the County Council to be in full support of this. Thank you. We appreciate that. And along the same lines, I don't want it to go without saying that this will be our fourth school that my administration has done in the five years that we've been here. We finished up Bennett High, we did Bennett Junior, we did West Salisbury, and we're now on Beaver Run. So we have constantly tried to keep our infrastructure up, and we are trying to protect that for, for the children. So, Yes, ma'am, Ms. Johnson. Hi there. Hi. Um, my name is Eileen Johnson, and I'm helping to represent Push for Education. Um, and we're a group of parents and community members and business people who are advocating for increased um, investment in public education in Wicomico County. Um, many of the parents in our group are here tonight and we're really um, grateful for them coming out and bringing their kids and taking time out of their busy schedules to be here. I know teachers also wanted to be here. Some of them are busy um, coaching and uh, trying to spend a little time with their families tonight. Um, I, uh, my son is in kindergarten um, at Pinehurst, and um, he was really, really adamant that I share the sign that he made with you all. He was very concerned about it. He, he thought this was gonna be a protest. <laughs> 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 um, he's been listening to us and wondering what's been going on the past couple weeks. 
uh, we've been gathering support and just to come out and share our message, which is that we think education should be our number one priority. Um, we are so incredibly grateful for you for doing this and for listening to us. Um, our group was able to meet with Mr. Culver this week, and um, we're so grateful that we were given an equal seat at the table and um, treated as if our voices matter just as much as business people. Um, and so thank you so much. And um, also, right now, I think we're just focusing our message at the county council um, to ask them to please keep this money in the budget. Um, and we also just want to let you know that we have a petition that is nearing a thousand signatures. We have 950 something. Um, and I'll be presenting that to you later this week. Um, so everybody that I've spoken to, you know, I spent a lot of time canvassing with the last midterm election and every house that I went to, I would say, what is the number one issue for you? And um, I would say the majority, well over 90% said education. That's something that keeps us up at night. Um, wondering if we're doing what's best for our kids. So really our focus right now is just trying to remember the children and we want to convey our message about what their needs are and just ask you to please keep this commitment. Um, we're so grateful for this commitment and we want to keep it going. Um, and so I want to please bear with me because I want to share a couple um, points that we have about why this matters, why this is so important, because we have people here who care, and because we want people to join our group. Um, we're going to stay here. We're not going away. Um, so I just want to um, thank you for this, and thank you for Bill Chambers of the Chamber of Commerce for listening to us and taking us seriously. He also um, says that um, education should be more of a priority in our county. Um, we know that you face difficult choices, um, but we know that if we wait for the perfect time, that time will never come. Right now, we are spending 6.7 million fewer dollars on education than we were 10 years ago. In 2006, we spent 49.66% of our overall county budget on education. And in 2019, we spent 36.57%. So we want to support Dr. Hanlon's plan because her plan helps reverse this trend in our county. And it also is a, a plan to transform our schools. Um, it's w a well-regarded plan because it's grounded in research. The board will be completely accountable for every dollar spent and our money will be invested smartly and effectively. I wanted to just share a a few thoughts that I had after volunteering in my son's school. I started volunteering a couple months ago, and that's what started me on this. And I feel like we forget about why we're doing this and why this is so important. And I truly believe that if every elected official from the county council to the county executive to the school board spent just one to two hours every month in the classrooms, they would be able to deepen and strengthen their commitment to education as our number one priority. Um, I was struck by a few things when I started volunteering in my son's school. He's in kindergarten. Um, the educators and administrators are absolutely fantastic. However, we also know that educators are at a breaking point. Over 20% of them are leaving after three years of burnout. They're struggling to make ends meet on their below average salaries. They need a signal of support from us, and Mr. Colvin has taken the step towards that. A pay raise will begin to help us recruit and retain great teachers. Great teachers balance inspiration and order, making students want to contribute in a positive way. We know that the statistically proven best way to recruit and retain great teachers is to adequately compensate them. I've heard so many parents decry the chaos in schools and the lack of school discipline. If you want school discipline, recruit great teachers. If you want great teachers, offer competitive pay. Another thing that struck me when I volunteered in Luke's school is that some children had the benefit of pre-K and some did not. 59% of kindergartners in our county are not ready. This is a disadvantage that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. 
basics like the alphabet, letter, and number recognition, and a habit of reading are tools that they carry with them through the grades. Each level of learning depends on the previous one and all depend on the first. Their brains develop more in the first five years than in the rest of their lives. And the experience they have, positive or negative, literally shapes how their brain develops. Educators model how we respect, value, and even love one another, and the children practice this with one another. This is far and away the ultimate goal of pre-K. We know it works, and we know it lasts. There are two special needs children in my son's class. Both are being treated with utter respect and love by other students and all the adults. Adults model how to treat one another, and the students learn compassion and patience with those special needs students. The classroom is a microcosm of how to build a community. If we give more children the chance to have healthy role models and healthy relationships, those children are more likely to thrive later in life. This is good for our community, but also just good for those little lives. They have inherent value. As it is now, we have pockets of places without pre-K and pockets of the population who do not qualify or cannot afford what pre-K there is. With a consistent universal system for all families, we can see consistent, nearly universal results. Long term, children who attend pre-K are more likely to pass all grades, graduate high school, go to college, have better paying jobs, and not be involved in the criminal justice system. We also know the overall economy is strengthened with a real commitment to public education. Tonight, we've taken the first step toward a real and sustained commitment to public education in our county. We are not going away. Parents, those of you who came tonight, thank you for being here. Your voices matter. Educators, your voices matter. Please do not be afraid to speak up. We have the power to change things. Imagine if we could all work together that on what so many of us agree ought to be our number one priority. Imagine if our community said that this is what we value. Imagine if Wicomico County began to have the reputation for great schools it's so clearly capable of happening. The possibilities are endless. We believe that there is hope, and so let's keep at it. Could everyone here who's in favor of increased investment in public education please stand? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Dorian Rogers. I'm a Salisbury University student, freshman. Um, I promise I won't be, you know, take too long. I'll buy you guys a pizza, even though, you know, don't let that college pay, you know, college tuition scare you, you know. I, I have some money, you know. But um, I, I kind of wanted to touch on the investment in education. Um, I wanted to first off and say, you know, Teachers, you guys are literally taking care of the future of tomorrow, and that is a great service. What you guys do, that's a great service as well. And I believe universal education, or universal pre-K, excuse me, um, that's definitely an investment that we need to take on. Um, I represent the PACE LLC, uh, civic, I mean, excuse me, uh, campus, community, and um, involvement. So we basically get involved within the community, and Dr. White, our uh, Salisbury University president has bestowed this honor upon us to raise money for um, the universal pre-k initiative and so we want to say that you know this Salisbury University LLC is here to raise money for this cause uh, universal pre-k it spreads diversity you know exposes our kids to our neighbors around us so that when they grow up they have an advantage so they can bring back to the community because we can't forget the community that we come from that's how we advance it. That's how we get together and we grow our community. And so that's a very important part. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say that we're here with different initiatives. For example, t-shirts, crab raffles, um, SU raffles. And um, I don't know if you guys have heard this. Your kids probably do. But Fortnite, you know, that's going on as well. But our main objective is to raise money for this momentous occasion, you know. Uh, reach out to us and we're here. I'm going to be here. And um, contact Dr. Pope, our coordinator, Dr. Surak. Lisa Howard, professor, um, but we're all here to join in and make sure education is a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carolyn Stegman. I actually have a question, uh, Mr. Calverhide. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
on the overall uh, overview of state aid to local governments produced by the state of Maryland, in other words, the total state aid to public schools, I looked it up on the web, and in 2016, Wicomico received the third most public aid of all the 24 counties in Maryland. And the only ones ahead of us were Baltimore City and Somerset County. They were subsidizing at that point $10,300 per student. So my question is, why do we get so much subsidy from the state of Maryland? And what, were to ha what would happen if that subsidy was reduced by the state? What would happen? I can't really give you a solid answer there, but it's a... Okay. Well, Wayne can do that. But let me tell you why we, we don't have the wealth that some of these other counties do, and I've, I've told this every year. We are an agricultural community. And the day that we want to take the chicken houses, the farmland, and all that away and plant houses here, we can be equal to Montgomery County. We're a beautiful county, as it is, with all the waterways. But we like our agriculture. We like Purdue. We like the farming. We like that. So our land is not developable in that sense. And that's where they get their tax base. We don't have that tax base, and that's what makes us the 23rd poorest county in the state of Maryland. But I have no intention of trying to change it. I don't want to lose, lose that. But if we don't get the state aid because we are equal, as how with the disparity grant. So if we didn't have the revenue cap, we would be in better shape, right? We busted the revenue cap to, to, to pass this along. And let me, let me get into that real quick. Okay. This year, we will we we'll call it bust the revenue cap because we'll, we'll collect more money than we're allowed to under the 2%. If we do that, that's about $350,000. That money automatically goes through K through 12. So we're putting that money towards K through 12. In addition, we're matching whatever else is to meet Dr. Hanlon's need of $800,000 plus the $1.2 million at maintenance of effort. So that all comes up to just about $2 million that we're working on with that. But with that in mind, we, we've got to, constain, to sustain that every year. This all becomes part of our maintenance of effort for the next years to follow. So we've got to come up with $2 million more from here on to eternity until something changes with the state. And, and that's going to be the hard part. I mean, I, I, I've made the statement. We don't know where everything is. It's going to cost us $7 million more a year for the $15 an hour wage. Nobody wants anybody to do poorly. That's not it. But can a county our size do $15 an hour? It's, it's going to be tough but we're going to have to do it because we're mandated. Just like with the Board of Education, through the Thornton Bill, we have had to give a certain amount of maintenance of effort. Now, my understanding is that once this is taken care of, as far as us trying to do what we can do, legally try to do, um, Board of Education should get a grant, and Mr. Ford can help me on that, for about 1.8 next year. Is that right, Bruce? The state of Maryland is supposed to give a grant out to us for helping out. For, But it needed us showing that we were trying to help as much as we could. So that's, that's part of the reason we have done this. And so, you know, um, we will continue to do what we can do to maybe minimize the future down the road as far as, you know, drain on our salaries and our, our, just our income. I hope that answers it somewhat. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Hi. Susan. How are you? Hi, Bobby. I'm Susan Purnell, and I'm here tonight as the chairman of the recently established Wicomico County Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to advocate for and improve the education for all students in Wicomico County. I first want to say thank you. I, it's for the first time tonight I feel Imagine 2022 can become Reality 2022. So thank you for putting this forth in the budget. We as an education foundation will do everything we can to support you in your efforts at, of convincing the county to go forward with this. Um, we have a lot of people here tonight um, that are on the foundation that I just want to quickly introduce. Mike Dunn, if you guys would stand up. Jen Wars, I can never pronounce her name. Warziniak, is that right, Jen? Michelle Wright, Robbie Raffish, Bill McCain, Sonia Whited, and Erica Joseph. Um, if I missed any of you, I'm sorry. But I just want you to know that um, one of our main priorities as well is to help fund any programs 
that will help Dr. Hanlon, members of the board, and the entire school system accomplish the goals that are presented in Imagine 2022. And for example, last year's budget increases allowed for, and we've talked about this a little bit tonight, five new pre-K classrooms and new teachers. It has been proven that pre-K has a tremendous potential to improve academic outcomes. So our foundation took on our first project, the purchasing of tech packages for the five pre-K classrooms approved in last year's budget. Each classroom was fitted with iPads for the students, smart boards for the teachers. And if more pre-K classrooms are added this year, we intend to furnish those classrooms technically as well. In Dr. Hanlon's State of the Schools address, she showed us that the goals of Imagine 2022 were attainable. So thank you again for keeping the ball rolling this year, funding those areas to make Dr. Hanlon's vision a success, and in turn to make our Comico County schools much closer to the best they can be. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Reverend Roosevelt Toussaint. Uh, I represent the Haitian community in this area. I'm the pastor of the Word of Life Center, uh, located uh, at uh, Jersey Road. Uh, first of all, I'm here to support uh, our superintendent, Dr. Dana uh, Henlin, uh, who's doing a great job in the community. Uh, she's uh, leading uh, this uh, department and doing a great job, and my daughter graduated and in, in the in the Comico County with a very uh, high uh, score, and I have uh, several members of my church where we graduated uh, in this uh, in this county. But I'm here this this afternoon to to really address some of the concerns that we have with the Haitian community. It is growing in a very uh, extraordinary pace. Because of that, we are facing some challenges. We are doing everything that we can to bring them into the mainstream of, of the American culture. We try to teach them, get them informed, so they can become uh, U.S. citizens. At this, at this, by, by the same token, uh, we have, uh, there are some concerns, there are some interests that we'd like to address in the area of education, because some of them, uh, they have been faced with language barrier, and because of that, some of the uh, needs, some of the benefits uh, have not been, uh, uh, they, they have not been ready to receive them. And Reverend, with all due respect, I don't mean to cut you off, but you need to take that to the Board of Education because we don't do that. We're a funding agent, yes. and those are taken care of by Dr. Hanlon's staff. Yes, and, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hanlon. We have met with us over uh, two months ago uh, to hear our concern, and we just, uh, I'm hoping, I'm trusting her leadership oh, I'm sure, that sure. our concerns are going to be uh, address or was going to be taken into consideration in the budget. We have also teamed up with, uh, with the second of leader, uh, Mr. Edward Lee, who, mm -hmm. who is uh, willing to help us. I mean, to make us a community that is uh, prog progressing in this area. And we have Mr. Abake, and we have Mr. David uh, Degre, and we have Mr. Edward Lee, who is the, the leader, of the, uh, the second of leader. I would like for him to, to come to address. Hey, Mr. <coughs> Hanlon, sir. Mr. Executive. How are you? How are you doing, sir? Good. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm pleased to uh, uh, have the opportunity to work uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pastor Roosevelt and Brother Baki and Mr. Daybreak, but we're here to support Dr. Hanlon's budget. We're here. 100% uh, to come uh, with her uh, wherever she has to go uh, in support of this budget. And we thank you and the board and, and your executive staff for taking this position. There are some things that in making the decision uh, to, to come here uh, that we have discussed with Dr. Hamlin. And she has been very open and gracious uh, to, to listen to, to us. But in terms of supporting the position that you have taken and that she has taken, you have a new group of people in town. You have a group that has grown over 100% over the last 10 years. Wow. And, 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 and they have unique challenges facing them. And I'm so thankful, again, 
that Dr. Hanlon has shown the professionalism to sit down to listen to this group. But I don't think that I would say to the people in this audience that we recognize uh, the challenges that we as a total community face in the Haitian community. And we want to bring it to you. We haven't had an opportunity to sit down with you, but we need to do that so that not only on this issues and other issues going forward, you will know the depth of it. Next, next, next year, we've got a very, very serious challenge in facing Wacomico County. And that is that the 2020 census is coming that's going to impact. This community has stepped out on the forefront to say that we want to get involved in that. We want to make certain that we have an accurate accounting of the Haitian community and every other minority group and total group in, Wu in, in Wacomico County. So we're not put in the position that when the pie gets cut up, then we look in terms of the numbers. I will tell you that last week we had a meeting with the IRS, and this may be a little side, but you may need to know this, that there was a, 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 a grant that came down from the state and not one for, for the four uh, census groups that want to support and work in the community for census, not one grant was filed from the eastern shore of Maryland. When they attempted to ask the question why, it was why, why was the grant closed off and why wasn't the eastern shore uh, uh, considered, Phew, no answer. So I want to come back to where we are tonight, to our point. I throw that out there just for information. I want to be, be assure you, uh, Mr. Executive, that this community, what the community that I represent, the Haitian community, will stand with you in any battle you face as it relates to this budget or any flack that you will catch. We're going to support you and Dr. Hanlon 100% in it. And I thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Just to let you know, Mr. Lee, um, I, have, I have met regularly for the last five months or so with, with um, Pierre, Ma is it Madeline? Pierre, Pierre. Yes. So I do meet with him regularly from the Haitian community. He's been to my office. Matter of fact, we wanted to try to work out something coming into the Civic Center, and we granted that um, free access one day for him. But, so we, we are working with the Haitian community and want to very much so. So uh, as far as the, uh, I met with the late girl that's in charge of the census for state of Maryland and gave her Pierre's name to contact as far as being able to help with the Haitian community because I understand there's what seven to eight thousand nine thousand Haitians in the area now the, the, the count ten years ago that was used the count that was used ten years ago was seven thousand okay it is now by drips and drabs from the census department somewhere around 40 14 thousand Pastor Tucson says, based on the growth of his church, and he said this when he was meet, when we met with Dr. Hanlon, that is an, it is greater than that. So, so, and, and you, you need to, you may want to know that we are working with Salisbury University on this issue to do a door-to-door -door, uh, uh, campaign uh, to to to, to kind of come to the point of identifying really what's that real number because once this. Uh, call it research, a survey, whenever we complete that, we're going to be in a, ba in a better position to come to you and say, here's a real number based on door to door, and we don't have to wait until the census comes out in 2022 with their report to find out where we stand or where you are when you're dealing with the federal government and the state on the numbers. That's wonderful. We appreciate your help, and we're glad to work with you in any way Thank we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, with all due respect, uh, I would like to bring to your attention that I've been in this uh, area since 1982. So I can witness, when I first came, it was only a few, few Haitians in this area. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of, of the first leaders in this area. I pastor one of the largest Haitian church, churches in this area. My mm -hmm. church is, is located at 1216 Jersey Road, Salisbury. I'm, I'm also an interpreter for, for, the, for Wakamiku County. So any, anything that you need to know about this, this community, by all means, you, you can contact me. I can give you all the information. I'll call At, at you present, friend. we are working to establish a Haitian center in this area where we can address all the social needs, education needs, job training. So, so that's what we are about. So okay. that's why we are here tonight to let you know what we represent because we are engaged. We are engaged in bringing 
the, 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 the Haitian community and, and to the mainstream. We want to make sure that they speak English. We want to make sure that uh, they have uh, a, a great education so they can be counted in, in, in this society. We appreciate that. Thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is David Daybreak. I'm actually a Haitian native. I was born in Haiti, grew up in Salisbury. Basically, Salisbury is my ad adopted home. It's basically my home. I had been in Salisbury since 1997. I moved last year, I come back. I couldn't live anywhere else. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is my home now. I appreciate the fact that you guys fully funded education. Education is the key to every individual in this, in every individual, black or white. And I remember when I was in Haiti, my mom had to struggle to pay for us to go to school, private school, because we understand the component of having a right education. Even though that we was poor, but we understand education is the few, is that's what's gonna give you a better opportunity in the future. And in America, the education is free, but a lot of people do not take the initiative to seize that opportunity. I was educated in a public system in America, didn't speak English, I managed to graduate high school. <laughs> I managed, you see. So now I'm in a position that I'm giving back to my community. I'm in the financial, I'm in the insurance, in, in insurance industry. I see the importance of it, of education. Guys, I appreciate and I admire the fact that you guys are thinking of education. So the only way for us to achieve, to obtain the next level, is to educate our youth better. Thank you, Dr. Thank Herman. you so much. Mr. Day, Mr. shall Paul. I say Mayor Day's father? Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's how I go through life. I understand. <laughs> and I won't tell you how long I've been here. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, first uh, applaud your decision. And I want to tell you I have tremendous appreciation for the challenges when you're the CEO of an organization. I, I, I'm the CEO of Purdue in addition to being Jake's dad. Um, it, you have tough choices to face, and I, I appreciate those. But I think you made a good one. And, I, and I, I would tell you I think you made a good one for a couple of reasons. One is, like you, this is my home. I grew up here. My kids went through this school system. I'm a product of the school system. My grandchildren, your grandchildren, they'll be a product of this school system. We want it to be the best it can be. Okay. And I, I have a particular issue in my business, and that is, and I've talked about this before, and that's recruiting people to this area. I'm, I'm trying to bring executives to this area. And I can get them to take the job, but all too often they want to go to Talbot County or Worcester County. Um, some of that's just, some people want to go to the beach, but there's an issue. And uh, th this will help. Now, it's up to the Board of Education and Dr. Hanlon and her staff to properly utilize and effectively utilize the funds you've provided. But I have confidence in Dr. Hanlon and her ability to use those funds wisely. So I think it's a good step and I appreciate it. I just want to tell you that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hi, how are you doing, Ashley? Hi, County Executive Culver. Um, I'm Ashley Teagle with the Wicomico Public Libraries. And I just wanted to share a few short remarks with you this evening. Um, I had a customer from the center branch write to one of our branch managers and shared, we sincerely appreciate all the innovative programs that the Wicomico County Public Library does. The center branch is a trailblazer for STEM related programs, which my son enjoys immensely. Although he's young, he's learned a lot and I have definitely seen a growth. Most recently, he was a part of the computer club where they built a computer from scratch. Patrick and Brian did a wonderful job leading the sessions. We are still in disbelief that Urgent built his own computer. He's very attached to it, a little too much, and it's become a topic of conversation. We sincerely appreciate the generous funding that the library provided for such a club. He's already looking forward to Zero Robotics this year. We hope that the center branch will continue with its innovative STEM programs. There is an acute need in the community. In 2018, we had over 224,000 visits to our three buildings in Bookmobile. There are over 58,000 Wicomico County residents who have library cards. 
In addition to circulating over 480,000 physical items, customers used electronic collections such as Hoopla and Libby over 42,000 times. Customers rely on us to offer educational programs. Over 15,000 people came to the library for story time, summer reading events, and other educational activities. Customers need us to close the digital divide. Last year, there were over 71,000 sessions on public internet computers and over 137 sessions of customers using the library's free Wi-Fi on their own devices. I am asking the county to keep funding for a new Pittsville location in the county's capital improvement plan. The residents of Pittsville are anxious to have an expanded library facility that will meet the needs of small business, students, and all residents. I am also requesting that the county maintains our current funding level to ensure that all the services that we're currently providing are funded. And lastly, I'm requesting that you consider increasing our budget, which will allow us to expand our services and aid us in retaining our qualified staff. The public library helps the community flourish. I look forward to Wicomico Public Libraries helping the citizens of Wicomico County thrive with the help of our talented and creative staff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Culver, for being here tonight and for an opportunity to um, hear what the community has to say. My name is Maida Finch, and I'm speaking to you today. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees for the Wicomico Public Libraries. We recently had um, a study done to help us assess the economic and community impact that the library brings to the community. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things to expand on what our new director, Ashley Teagle, just said. Um, the study estimated that we offer the community $13.5 million annual value in the services that we provide. Make that a little bit more manageable of a number because to me that's really big. Um, for every dollar that's invested in the public library, there's a rate of return of $5.40 back from what we give to the community. A large part of that comes from the programming and the services that we offer. And in this example, um, our programs, which are free to the public, um, are valued at $92,000 per year. Our programs support the efforts for education. For example, we have the Homework Help Center where we offer free after-school tutoring. Um, if you watched the news last night, um, the principal from uh, Prince Street Elementary talked about how his students use these services. It's not just the tutoring that we offer, but we also offer free materials if kids have projects and need help with that. We offer early, the Early Reader Van program, which goes to daycare centers in the community and provides buckets full of books and library materials, all on particular themes and topics. This is for the youngest readers in our community, the readers-to-be, um, who are getting ready to begin school shortly. We also have opportunities for adults. Project Read is a free adult tutoring program, offers tutoring services for reading, writing, and math. Um, adults in our program have aspirations to attend Warwick, to pursue degrees, to get jobs. Some of them just need their driver's license. The Job Search Center offers um, computers and advice and bulletin boards for helping um, people prepare to search for jobs. And our Lawyers in the Library program brings lawyers and um, volunteers into the library to offer free legal services to people who show up asking for help. I mentioned the programs that we offer for adults because I believe that when we improve the life opportunities for adults, we will see that the overall quality of life across the lifespan improves. Um, I'm a former middle school teacher, and now my work at SU keeps me still involved in the public schools, and I know that it takes the whole community to ensure the success of students. That's why today I'm asking you, Mr. Culver, in fact, I honestly, I'm beseeching you because I know we've asked before, to please help us to cure, to help us serve the needs of the community, to support the educational initiatives of the county by a slight increase in our budget. $77,000 would allow us to increase our programs and services and to make a difference in continuing to support the education initiatives that the county values. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions, comments? My name is Sebastian Sivaraj. Uh, I have a question regarding this PowerPoint. Do we have access to this PowerPoint? Is it available? We online? have some hard copies up hard here. Copies okay. and we will put them on the county's internet um, website. Our website. Thank you for serving the Thank community. Thank you. 
democracy. Councilman McCain. Good evening. Good evening. I actually had no intention of speaking this evening, but the fact that I feel you've moved the needle in the right direction with the full funding of the Board of Edge request. I wanted to publicly thank you for doing that. Uh, for years, we, you know, I hear we'll make the statement that education is our number one priority, but from the government side, really the only way we have to demonstrate that is through the funding mechanism. And the step you've taken tonight is, you know, move in the right direction. And I'm, I'm just so pleased to do, you know, see that. I wanted to thank you. And also I wanted to point out, I'm glad this slide is still up there because, you know, when I look at you know, where we are, and I want to I want to use an example of our neighbors to the south, Somerset. You know, Somerset's spending more than we are on a per pupil basis. And also, if you look on the right side, they are now the second. They're spending the second highest total in the entire state of Maryland with their state aid and federal aid combined. But that's a commitment they've made to education, and I feel we've moved in that right direction. We're, we are not a poor county. We're a county. We have Salisbury University, a world class university in our backyard. We have a world-class hospital with PRMC. We have the best community college in the state of Maryland. We're the crossroads to Del Marva. We have an airport. We have a zoo. We have Henry Parker Sports Complex. We have Cram. You know, I could go on and on with all the great assets we have. Those counties at the bottom don't have those assets. And this is a step moving in the right direction. And tonight, we're acting like a rich county, not a poor county. And I say rich in spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to, to clarify some of those numbers for you, Somerset County only has about 2,800 students. We, Dr. Hanlon has over 14,000 and some, almost 15,000 students. So it may only seem like a few dollars difference, but it makes a big difference when you have that many students. So, but, you know, we're trying. We're doing what we can do. So um, this is the one I've been waiting for all night. You know, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I just have to hear from Don. You know, do I get a kudu had, or anything from you? I had two different sets of comments prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Donna Hanlon, Superintendent of Thanks. Schools. Don Fitzgerald, President of the Board of Education. Good evening, County Executive Culver. Thanks. How are you, nice. um, Mr. Strasburg, Mr. Young. Thank you so much for providing this opportunity to the community to provide input on your budget. My comments will be brief and I simply want to applaud you for listening. You have heard our community, you've listened to them, you've listened to parents, you've listened to business leaders, to our board and our staff, who have been speaking to you not just tonight, but over the course of almost three years about the importance of recognizing that funding public education is an investment in this community's future. As you know, we have a plan, Imagine 2022. I've heard that somewhere. I, I've heard that too, <laughs> and I keep hearing Dr. Hanlon's plan. This is not just my plan. This is the plan of our entire school system, of our board. It is our community's plan for improving education in our system. Just as we want our students to do, we begin by imagining what we can accomplish, then we believe that we can accomplish it, and then we achieve it. And that's what we ultimately are looking for through Imagine 2022, the ultimate achievement of our almost 15,000 students. The efforts of our community, I just can't say enough, have been incredible. The Greater Salisbury Committee, the Chamber of Commerce, the Education Foundation, individual community members, Push for Education, just have been incredible to see. And I appreciate that so much. And again, your willingness to listen and to recommend the funding for Imagine 2022 speaks volumes about your belief in the importance of investing in our community. At the State of the Schools, I presented compelling data on the progress of our school system and the importance of continuing our momentum. I presented data that's evidence that we are a good school system, but our community deserves a great school system. I talked about Jim Collins' work, Good to Great, and how in a good to great transformation there's no single defining action, no single lucky break. Collins tells us that the progress of going from good to great resembles relentlessly pushing this giant flywheel, building momentum until a point of breakthrough. 
He tells us that once you fully grasp how to create that flywheel momentum and apply that understanding with intense and relentless discipline, you get the power of strategic compounding. And once you get your flywheel right, you stay on that course for years, decision upon decision, action upon action, turn by turn, each loop adding to the cumulative effect. And he talks about feeding that flywheel to build and accelerate the momentum. Imagine 2022 is our flywheel with our strategic priorities as its elements. And as a result of your efforts to fund Imagine 2022, you are providing the resources to feed our flywheel, allowing us to continue to build our momentum. So on behalf of this entire community, but most especially the 15,000 students and over 3,000 employees, we want to thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Donna, before, before you leave, Donna, I want you to meet Dallas Baker. He gave up a dump truck to help you get your funding, okay? So, so if it snows really bad, just say we're going to take it easy for a day. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Colbert, I've been on voice rest for a while, but I had to come out tonight, and I didn't know what I was going to have to say. I didn't know what I want to hear you say either, really. But yeah. You told me that yesterday. <laughs> but one thing I'm going to tell you in front of all these people, Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're quite welcome. Because it's not about you and I, and you've heard me say this before. It's about the students in this county. You're a product, and I'm a product, and I want the best we can give them. Thank you. And I think you've taken that step. We're trying. So. And I really want to appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, you Mr. Fitzgerald. Appreciate all you do. Okay, well, with that, if there's no other cust uh, comments or questions, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Again, I want to thank the board members. I want to thank my staff for being here and all the work that they have done. We'll stay up here for a while. If you've got any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. Plus, we've got some hard copies if you'd like to have this PowerPoint. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Appreciate you coming. <laughs>